God created us male and female, and God created gender and biology to match. God does not allow us to change his design because we feel like changing our gender. And sexual relations are to be between a man and a woman as the epitome of intimacy in marriage. That's what the Bible says. So we're in this series called The Bible Speaks, and already we are, have dealt with a number of hot-button topics. We've seen what the Bible has to say about addiction, abortion, racism, depression, but I don't think any of those hot buttons are hotter than the topic that we're going to talk about today, and that is the Bible speaks to the issue of sexual identity. Uh, the number of people struggling with their sexuality and sexual identity is rapidly growing. 7.6% of Americans say that they are somewhere on the spectrum of LBGTQ. 23.7% of Gen Z, that's people the ages of 12 to 27, identify as LBGTQ. Uh, that's almost one in four. Twice as many women as men identify as either gay or bisexual. And Gen Z women are more than twice as likely as any other group to identify as transgender. Now, as I was studying for this, I came across something I had never heard before and that is gender seasons. And that's the belief that a person's gender is linked or tied to the different seasons. And so you can identify as a man during summer and fall because you feel more masculine in the summer and fall. And then you can identify as a woman in winter and spring because you feel more feminine in winter and spring. This is the kind of thing that people are getting sucked into. And the tragedy is that it is particularly true of young adults, teens, and youth. And so we need to know what the Bible says to the issue of sexual identity. Now early on, even before we started this series, I asked you to pray for me as I prepared these messages and delivered these messages because I wanted to make sure that I spoke clearly where the Bible speaks. And I also wanted to do it with love and compassion and grace. And if you've been praying and if you're continuing to pray, I am grateful for that. This past week, I reached out to a number of my closest friends and confidants, and I asked them to particularly pray concerning this message, because it is such a sensitive topic. Several of them responded to me and said they would be praying and that they thought it was a timely topic and something the church needed to address. I told one of the persons that I'm going to talk about it because because I think our congregation needs to hear this. There might be some of you struggling with the issues. And I know in conversations with some of you that you have family members or children or grandchildren or classmates or friends who are struggling with the issues of sexuality and sexual identity. So we're going to talk about this today. And you really, in the world, can't get away from it. I mean, if you watch TV, if you listen to the radio, even if you go shopping, you are confronted with the issue of sexual identity. And so I thought that maybe first what we should do is define some of the terms that you'll hear. Okay, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put terms up on the screen with definitions. I might just make a comment or two. But these are terms related to this issue. And if we are going to speak to this issue, if we're going to understand what's being said around us, if we're going to be able to make any kind of impact at all, we need to know what is being said. And quite honestly, in this conversation, new words are being added to the discussion and definitions are regularly being changed. Okay, so let's start with the acronym LGBTQ. The letter L stands for lesbian. It's a female who is sexually attracted to females. G is for gay. Just means homosexual. 
homosexuality in all of its forms. B is for bisexual. That's a person who can be sexually attracted to both genders. T is for trans or transsexual, a person who identifies as the opposite gender they were assigned at birth. And Q can stand for queer, which refers to a gay man who acts exorbitantly effeminate. Or, more likely now, Q stands for questioning. Someone who is questioning their gender or sexuality. But there are a number of other terms in this discussion we also need to be familiar with. The word binary. Binary is the belief that there are just two genders, male and female. Cisgender. That is a person who believes their gender and biology align to identify as either male or female. Gender or gender identity. This is the socially accepted characteristics, norms, or behaviors of men or, and women. And so we're talking here about expectations and characteristics and roles that a man or a woman is to play in society. And you see, the, the world culture, the world's culture says that your sex is about biology. Your sex is about chromosomes and body parts. But your gender is about these characteristics and roles and expectations. So according to the world's definitions, sex and gender can be completely separated from one another. Gender dysphoria, that refers to the distress, anxiety, discomfort a person feels because they believe their biology and gender are not matched. And transgender, this is a person who chooses to identify as what they feel is their gender instead of biological sex. So this is a man who chooses to identify as a woman or a woman who chooses to identify as a man. And so sexual identity includes gay and straight, male and female, cis and trans. But what we want to know is what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about sexual identity? And here's what the Bible says. And I would suggest that you have a pen or pencil in your hand so that you can jot down these references either on your outline or on something else because we just don't have the time this morning to together look up these different references. So I'm also going to put them up on the screen and then talk about each one a little bit. We're not, we're not going to have on the screen every verse or passage in the Bible that talks to the issue of sexuality or sexual identity, but we're going to have the majority of them, okay? The first is Genesis 127. God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The whole creation story in Genesis chapter 1 is told in the form of contrasts. Light and dark. Land and sea. Uh, plants that, are, that produce seeds and plants that produce fruits. And then, fish and birds. And then finally we get to male and female. And so what this verse is telling us is that God determines whether you are male or female. And the Bible identifies all of humanity as either male or female. Now, just as there are different varieties of fish and there are different varieties of birds, there can be different varieties of men and women. For instance, the Bible says that Jacob loved to cook and bake. He was at home in the kitchen. But throughout the Bible, he is always referred to as a man. Deborah was a commander of Israelites' troops, and she led the Israelite army into battle against the Canaanite army. But she is always referred to in the Bible as a woman. And so all of humanity is either male or female. And God determines our gender at the moment of conception. Every cell in your body has the genetic code saying whether you are male or female. 
Next passage, Genesis chapter 6, verses 18 through 19. Now this is where God is telling Noah to build an ark uh, because God is going to flood the earth. And he tells Noah how to fill the ark, okay? And so God says to Noah, but I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark. You and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. The word that is used for men, the words I should say, that are used for men or males in the Bible appear over 7,200 times. The words for female or woman also appears hundreds of times. And so all throughout Scripture, humanity is divided as either male or female. And in this passage, God is telling Noah the wisdom of his design. He is telling Noah to put male and female of everything, every animal on the ark, so that it can repopulate when the flood is over. And that is part of the beauty and wisdom of God's design that we procreate, okay? God designed us differently, not so that we could choose to be something else, but so that we would complement one another. Next passage, Leviticus 18.22. says, Do not practice homosexuality. Having sex with another man as with a woman, it is a detestable sin. Leviticus 20, verse 13 says, If a man practices homosexuality, having sex with another man as with a woman, both men have committed a detestable act. They must both be put to death, for they are guilty of a capital offense. This says that homosexuality is a detestable sin, and that it is punishable by death. Now, today in the United States, we don't put people to death for committing homosexual acts. But what this is saying is it is saying that homosexuality is in a different category of sin. Most sins that are mentioned in the Bible are not punishable by death. But this is saying that there are some sins that so violate God's purposes and so violate God's design and can be so corrupting that God says the best thing, the wisest thing, is just to purge that sin from among us. Deuteronomy 22.5 A woman must not put on men's clothing, and a man must not wear women's clothing. Anyone who does this is detestable in the sight of the Lord your God. So a female who tries to make herself appear as a male, a female who tries to put herself off as a male, or dress to look like a male, that's detestable as it is for a man to wear women's clothing, as it is for a man to try and put himself off as a woman, it is detestable. So this is the whole cross-dressing transgender thing. Romans chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. says, That is why God let go of them and let them do all these evil things, so that even their women turned against God's natural plan for them and indulged in sex sin with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sex relationships with women, burned with lust for each other. Men doing shameful things with other men, and as a result, getting paid within their own souls with the penalty they so richly deserved. So it was that when they gave God up and would not even acknowledge Him, God gave them up to to doing everything their evil minds could think of. In this passage, Paul is talking about the downward spiral of sin. And what he says is that when a nation or a people or a person rejects God and chooses to do their own thing, what happens is it puts them on this downward spiral where once they once they reject God and violate God's will, it makes it easier to do that the next time. And it takes them deeper on this spiral more and more into the pit of hell. And specifically what Paul is talking about here, he is saying that that one of the turns on this spiral is when we choose to give in to our own sexual desires, our own sexual fulfillments, instead of living according to God's design and God's protections. 
Only a couple more verses. 1 Corinthians 11, 13 through 16 says, Judge for yourselves, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? But that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? For long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Now, we don't have time to dig down into this passage. Really, what it's talking about is submission in the church. But what I want us to notice for today is that Paul says that God wants men to look like men and women to look like women. Okay? And one last passage, Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ. And what this church is, what this verse is describing is that all of humanity is is described in different ways, two different ways, okay? All of humanity is either Jew or Gentile. All of humanity is either slave or free. And all of humanity is either male or female. So there is no in-between, okay? You can't, you can't cheat on these things. There is no in-between. There is no gray place. So let's summarize what these verses tell us. And by the way, did you notice that all of the principles about sexuality and sexual identity in the Old Testament were affirmed and repeated in the New Testament? Because sometimes people say, well, God says those things in the Old Testament because in Old Testament times, he was was harsh and he was judgmental. But in the New Testament, he's all loving and kind and gracious. No, every principle about these things stated in the Old Testament is repeated and affirmed in the New Testament because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what is it that these verses say? Well, they say that God created us male and female, and God created gender and biology to match. God does not allow us to change his design because we feel like changing our gender. And sexual relations are to be between a man and a woman as the epitome of intimacy in marriage. That's what the Bible says. And one of the values of our church is that we will boldly preach, teach, and live the Bible with compassion and clarity. And so because that's what the Bible says, that's where this church is going to stand. That's what we believe. That's what we'll defend. But there's more that we need to talk about. What is behind gender confusion? Why is all of this happening? What's going on? Why are so many people struggling with their sexuality and their sexual identity? Now, some people who are struggling with these things believe that it's because God has made a mistake. They feel this way because God has made a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't make mistakes. But we do live in a world that has been deeply affected by sin. God did not create this world with death in it. But sin introduced death into the world. God did not create this world with disease in it. But sin introduced disease into this world. And part of living in a broken world is that a small percentage of people are born with what is called intersex traits. That means they might be born with both male and female sexual organs, or certain sexual organs might be missing, or it might be a chromosome problem, or it might be a hormone problem. But that's not God making a mistake. That's just a consequence of living in a sin-sick, sin-broken world. And that affects about one out of every 1,500 to 200 births. So for the almost 11% of young men and the almost 30% of young women who are struggling with their sexuality and their sexual identity, why is that happening? What's going on? Well, I I think it centers around these three things. 
The first is pain. Pain. Uh, Katie McCoy is a theology professor, and she writes about culture and women's issues, and she wrote this. Gender confusion is not just growing, it's erupting. And by a landslide, it's girls who seem to be most affected by the explosion. What previously was recognized as insecurities and trauma in a young girl have increasingly become diagnosed as a transgender identity. A generation of girls is manifesting their pain through transgender identities, while those charged with their care, parents, teachers, doctors, counselors, while those who are supposed to care about them neglect the sources of their mental suffering. Emily was a smart, attractive, popular high school student. But Emily didn't think of herself that way. Emily thought she was fat and unattractive, and so she decided she would do something about it. And she began purging after meals. Her friends discovered it when after eating, she would always take herself away and go to the restroom. And one day, Emily came out of the restroom, and there were her friends. And they confronted her, and Emily got the help she needed. The loving thing to do is to confront someone and correct someone when their thinking and their actions are wrong. Except when it comes to sexual identity. The world tells us that when it comes to sexual identity, we should never confront that. We should never try to correct that, but instead we should always encourage and support the lies that they are telling themselves. Now we know that young adults and young people are struggling with mental health issues. But if they don't get the help they need, if people, including the church, do not take their struggle seriously, they can easily misunderstand the source of their pain. And they can be led into therapies and treatments and surgeries that are damaging and can't be undone. Many are encouraged to do hormone therapy. Some end up getting surgeries that cannot be reversed. And the truth is that there are a lot of people detransitioning now, and most of them are saying, why didn't somebody care enough? Why didn't somebody love enough? Why didn't somebody tell me the truth? Listen, unhappiness and dissatisfaction with your life is not going to improve by trying to live and act in opposition to God's design. It's just not. Second thing that is contributing to this is Satan. Satan. Many people think that transgenderism is something new. It's not. The Bible says that God is a God of order. And so Satan does everything he can to sow disorder and chaos into God's order. Satan does everything he can to sow chaos and discord into God's design for male-female relationships. He does everything he can to so try and sow discord and chaos into God's roles for men and for women. And when we look back in ancient history, what we see is that many of the gods talked about in the Old Testament and the New Testament were both male and female and could change their genders. So they would maybe on this day present themselves as a male god and tomorrow present themselves as a female god. And some of the cults worshiping these false gods were served by priests who presented themselves as either being completely asexual or they were priests serving who were men and presented themselves as women. And Paul writes, and he says, that the worship of those gods was actually the worship of demons. And so Satan was behind it. And we would be foolish to not see or believe that what's happening today is demonic effort and satanic strategy. That's what's happening. There's the third thing that contributes to this. 
And that is sin. Sin. Just simply the rejection of God's design and God's word. Did you know that there is a Queen James Bible? Did you know that there is a Bible that is simply called the Gay Bible? And what they do is they they misinterpret and twist the words of Scripture to make it sound as if God endorses sexual sin. But here's the crux of the issue. The vast majority of people And the numbers keep growing because we keep getting farther and farther away from God and farther and farther away from believing that the Bible is authoritative. Okay, So the vast majority of people simply reject the authority of Scripture. Now they might think the Bible is is a nice book. Maybe there's some good advice in it. But they completely reject the idea that the Bible is authoritative and can tell us how to live our lives. And what's leading to gender confusion is that people are putting their feelings over reality, and more importantly, they are putting their feelings over God's word and God's design. And so a person who thinks they will feel happier living a homosexual lifestyle chooses that and rejects God's word. A man who feels like he'll be happier living as a woman chooses that and rejects God's word. A woman who feels like she'll be happier living as a man chooses that and rejects God's word. And until people come back to recognize that God is God and we aren't, and that the Bible is authoritative, this whole gender confusion thing is going to continue and it's going to spread. And that puts the onus right back in the lap of the church. If we don't stand up for the word of God, who will? If we do not declare that the Bible is authoritative, who will? If we do not approach people and show them the wisdom of God's ways and the beauty of God's design, who will? That brings us to the fourth thing. Is there hope? Is there hope? Is there hope for the person who's caught in one of these lifestyles? Or for the person who's struggling with gender dysphoria? Or the person who's confused about their sexuality? Is there hope? Yes, there is. And so, if you have a Bible, or on a Bible app, I want you to look up 1 Corinthians Chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians, chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Now, Paul writes this to a messed up church. And he writes this to a messed up church located in a messed up city. Okay, there were people in the church of Corinth who were enmeshed in sexual sins, and they were living in a city where there were temples to these false gods. So there were temples where gender-confused priests were serving gender-confused gods. And look at what Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning at verse 9. Some of you are still trying to find it. We'll give you a second. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Paul is saying very clearly here that a person who continues to live their life in sexual sin, a person who continues to live their life ripping others off, a person who continues to live their life as a drunk, a person who continues to live their life practicing homosexuality will not 
inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11 says, And that is what some of you were. Did you notice that's past tense? That's not who they are anymore. There's hope. They've been set free. And the key word is that next word, but. But. What is the hope? The hope is that things can change. The hope is that you can be set free. The hope is that you don't have to be trapped in your sin. And Paul says here that that hope, that change happens when we are washed. That is a word that talks about a spiritual cleansing that God does in us when we are baptized. Acts chapter 22 says, Come, be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on His name. And he says that they were sanctified. So when we are baptized, what happens is the Holy Spirit enters into us, and the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to turn from our sinful lifestyle and to live a life that is holy, a life that is honoring to God, a life that is within God's design and intention. And then he says, you've been justified. Justified means that even after we've been baptized, we're not going to live a perfect life. In fact, there might be times when we go back to our old stinking way of thinking. We might go back to acting and living for a time the way we did, but God sees us in Christ as holy, as righteous, as godly. The gay person, the bisexual, the transgender, is not any closer or farther away from God than the moral person who goes to Sunday school every week but doesn't know Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Is there hope? There is hope because of Jesus. Because He went to the cross and died for the punishment of our sins, and He rose again to offer us a new way to live life. So is there hope? Yes. My friends, there is hope. Hope is in Jesus. Come to Christ. Let's pray. Father God, I pray, I pray three things. Father, I pray that if there's somebody here this morning struggling with some of these things, that the message that has come through clearly is that your Bible speaks to it and your grace is sufficient for it. Father, if there is somebody who is trapped in one of these lifestyles, I pray that they would come to Christ because it is only in and through Christ that they can be set free. But Father, I pray for us as a church. I pray that we would not step back and bury our head in the sands about these kinds of issues, but that we would be diligent about knowing what the Bible says and we would stand firm on that, unflinching. Because if, if we don't stand up for your word, who will? If we don't stand up for the beauty of your design, who will? Help us to do it firmly, but lovingly, compassionately, graciously. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.